Hello and welcome to this Let's Chat, It's About Time. My name is Kira Emmons. I'm a member of ASSO's Appeals Committee as well as an event group leader for the electronics and some of the inquiry events. I'm excited today to be guest hosting this installment of the Let's Chat series because our regular host is one of the presenters today. Uh, give me just a second to spotlight the three of us. Today, we have the two most knowledgeable people we could possibly have to talk about It's About Time, the national event supervisors. Many of you will recognize Karen Emmons as VASO's state director emerita. She's also a board member and the treasurer. Uh, together, she and her husband, Ian, are co-event group leaders for the technology events. Thank you both for offering your thoughts and experience to us today. Sure. A uh, quick disclaimer before we get going, in our time this morning, we can't possibly cover every rule or situation that might come up at tournament. Nothing we say here today supersedes a rule or rule clarification. You still need to read the rules. Read the rules often because every time you do, you'll see something new uh, and then go read them again. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and don't forget about the VASO clarifications, which are on our website, uh, which are just as binding as the rules. As we talk, I encourage you to put your questions in the chat so we can incorporate them into our conversation. And I know we've got a lot to talk about, so let's get started. Uh, so can you all begin with just a brief overview? What is the task? Well, the task this year, and it's about time, um, is a very new one. It's building a device that triggers a single signal to occur three times at equally spaced time intervals. I think the best thing to compare it to is a metronome, right, which ticks off, um, you know, the tick is the signal, but slower than a metronome because the intervals will be bigger. Right. Okay. Uh, so in broad strokes, where do the points come from? Well, similar to all the physics events, it's a hybrid event. Um, so that the score is part the exam score, the device score, and the design log. The exam score is 45%, the device score is 45%, and the design log score is 10% of your score. The high score wins. Incidental note, uh, the exam and the device scores are scaled. So the highest exam score gets 45 points and all the rest are scaled appropriately. All the rest of the exams are the, will be scaled appropriately. And that happens with the device score as well. Uh, we're gonna do some specifics of the device scoring later, but the tiebreakers for the event, the first tiebreaker is the score from the second device time trial. And then the second tiebreaker is designated questions from the exam. Okay, so when you say it's scaled, what you mean is that a team's final score actually depends on the raw scores from the other teams of the tournament. That's right. Um, right. So that the highest, the person who scores the highest on the exam will be scaled to 45 to make the 45%. And then everybody else gets that same percentage that was multiplied the first exam by the highest exam score to get okay. their final exam score. That's great, though, because that means that if it's just a really hard written test, it doesn't reduce the amount that that counts to the score. That's why the uh, committee's done that. Yeah. <laughs> OK, so this is not a new event. We had this last year. Can you tell us what's different this year? Sure. Um, <clears throat> there's a, a number of changes. Um, in, first of all, in the, the exam topics, uh, these were changed a little bit and uh, cleaned up a little bit. Um, the, the calendars um, have been changed to the Chinese and the Mayan. Um, the uh, half-life topic has been expanded uh, considerably. Um, and then there, there was a kind of a funky topic called dynamical systems that we've, we've better defined um, and and uh, kept it a little more within um, within bounds for the uh, for the experience level. Um, a much bigger deal, though, is that the device that the students are asked to build is an entirely new device with a very different purpose. 
So last year's devices will simply, well, you might be able to adapt last year's device, but it will not work as is. Okay, that's important to know. Uh, so what does the new device have to do? So as, um, as I stated in my summary, the device has to repeat a single, a single signal each time a selected interval elapses. Um, and it is supposed to do this three times. So the interval is selected from a range that varies by tournament. Uh, at regionals, it's it can be selected from the 10 to 30 seconds range, at states from 10 to 45 seconds. Um, and it might, yes, it might be partial. So it could be 10.3, something like that, seconds. There will be two trials, each with a different interval. So it has to be able to, students have to be able to adjust it uh, at the tournament. So for example, if the interval for the time trial, if the event supervisor tells you it's 10.2 seconds, the device should be signaling at 10.2 seconds, 20.4, which is two times 10.2, and 30.6, which is three times 10.2 seconds. Okay, great. Uh, can you give us an idea of the general construction parameters for this device? Uh, certainly. So um, the overall dimensions, uh, it must fit in an 80 centimeter cube uh, when it's when it's being brought into impound. Um, and and uh, remember that you must impound the sand or water that your device uses, if in fact it uses sand or water, um, and it must fit into that cube as well. That um, could be a challenge. Yes, it can. <laughs> um, the the device when you set it up uh, to to operate it it can expand and be uh, somewhat larger than that. Um, <clears throat> another another important uh, uh, parameter here is that we want to minimize impacts to other teams. So um, this year, in many cases, uh, the students will be actually taking the exam with their device set up next to them. And um, and so we want to make sure that 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 it operates in a reasonable amount of space, so that the students next to them have space to take their exam, and uh, also that it does not spill water or sand or whatever um, uh, to uh, to make a mess of the room. Uh, so just to clarify, at regionals though, we're doing written tests separately from the device testing, correct? Um, at VASA regionals, that is true, yes. But uh, that might not be the case at an invitational you go to, and it exactly. definitely won't be the case at our state tournament, which will be in person. Correct. Yes. Correct. Okay. Um, the, no electronics are allowed. Um, and so in particular, um, uh, you, electronic scales are a bit of an issue. You You may use an electronic scale to prepare the device for a trial, say to measure out uh, sand or water, but um, but you must remove it before the trial begins. It can't be part of the device. Um, no commercial counters, tally devices, timepieces, or their parts are allowed in the device. Um, and the device must not be designed to require manual intervention during its operation. Um, so we had an example from last year, we encountered a team that had to pour a constant stream of water into their device uh, as it was operating. Um, one, one exception to this is that you may touch your device one, um, once per time trial to, uh, to continue its operation if it jams up. Um, there's a penalty associated with that, but we'll, we'll talk about the that uh, those details of scoring a little bit later. But it's uh, still better than having a jam and not getting a score. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, but Much the distinction better. here is between the having your device designed to require that touch versus having a sort of incidental need okay. for the touch because <laughs> it jammed or got stuck or whatever. Right, exactly yes. so, yes. Um, and then um, one final note is that that your 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 device does not have to stop automatically after three trials. It, like a metronome, it can just keep going 
you know, sort of indefinitely, and then you're allowed to just stop it manually um, with no penalty at all. Um, right, that's not the, yeah. The okay. Thing. Great. So you keep talking about the signal that has to come three times. Can you tell us more about that? Because that's like a big new thing this year. It's a big new thing. There was a lot of communication about, or no, excuse me, not, there was a lot of confusion about signals last year and that, that I know that that confusion is continuing on this year. Um, so first we're gonna say, what is a repeating signal? So it's any event that the event supervisor can perceive by eye or ear, right? So it could be a flag popping up, a bell being rung, uh, the movement of a lever arm, uh, a moving indicator passing the same mark, a container being filled, or a container being emptied. Any one of these things where the event supervisor can know when to stop his or her stopwatch, that's, you know, that signals it. Um, and the requirements for that signal, each occurrence must be the same event. So each occurrence of the signal must be the same event produced by the same mechanism. And I know that's creating some confusion. We're gonna look at that one in a little bit more detail in a minute. It's gotta be produced by the device. Competitors cannot call out and say, time, it's stopped, I saw it, do, you know, when the signal occurs. It has to be perceivable by the event supervisor. We can't take the competitor telling us when it's gotten to the right spot. Um, and it has to be distinct in that it occurs at the end of each of the equally spaced time intervals, but not also in between. So it can't be uh, count 25 ticks and then that's the signal and then count another 25 ticks and then that's the signal. It would be each tick, the first tick, the, first tick, the second tick and the third tick. And those would be the distinct signal. So it only has to occur when it is actually intending to signal. The signal can't occur at other times. Next slide, Ian. So there is a critical, critical uh, clarification that has been produced about this same event produced by the same mechanism. Um, I'll tell you, it's it's a national clarification. Uh, Ian and I wrote it. So it's also a VASO clarification. So it's, it's across the United States to try to explain a little bit more what this means. Because what does it mean to have one mechanism, the same mechanism and the same event? Um, and so somebody was asking about that. This is the question that they asked us at nationals. Can different parts of the one mechanism trigger the signal? So three sections of a mechanism trigger the same signal. Um, the clarification we wrote is written as a long paragraph. This is actually the wording of the clarification, but we've split it out into its component pieces to help us um, attack it this morning. So each signal happens because something, a mechanism causes it to happen. That's kind of an obvious statement, right? Signals don't happen out of nowhere. Something makes them happen. So it could be, for example, the bell sounding is a signal, but the sound is caused by the hammer striking the bell and that's the mechanism. A flag being raised is the signal, but it's caused by a string pulling it up the pole. So the hammer and the string are the mechanism. It is the thing immediately prior to the signal that causes the signal to happen. Thus, the mechanism must be the same in all the instances, right? The rules say the same event produced by the same mechanism. So a way to think about this and a way to judge your own and understand your own device is in order to allow for the next signal, essentially the mechanism is going to need to reset itself. Right? The hammer's going to hit the bell, but to be able to do it again, it's got to retract back. Or the string pulls the flag down or up or whatever, but it, and it and, but it's going to have to release and let the flag back down. So the mechanism has to reset. That's the mechanism. However, multiple different components or parts in the device can initiate the action of the mechanism that causes the signal. So you might have different cogs that initiate that hammer action. The hammer action is the same, it's the mechanism, but anything in front of that can be different. You can have different pieces that make that mechanism 
do its signal. Um, so yes, some examples. A lever arm or water level passing different marks. We saw a lot of this last year with burettes and water passing at various different marked levels. That's not a single signal because it's different lines that it's passing. A lever arm or water level passing the same mark is a single signal. A single metal arm striking three different bells is not a single signal. But three metal arms striking one bell is three mechanisms. Again, that's also not allowed. Remember, single signal, single mechanism. However, three gear assemblies controlling one metal arm that strikes one metal bell is one mechanism and one signal. Can we pause here and see if anybody has any questions they'd like to ask about that? I know that that's a lot to, a lot to process and you might have to think about it a little bit, but I'm hopeful that this clarifies a lot of pieces of it. If I were a competitor in this event, I think I would watch this segment of the recording back on loop a few times because this is really, really key and it's a little bit complicated. It is, but again, think about the mechanism is pretty much going to have to reset. And that's that's the question you ask for yourself. If what you have doing, striking or making the signal happen doesn't reset to go for the next signal, you're probably not on track. I'm not saying that's strictly true. There might be a creative way. But this is a really good way of thinking this through. Yeah, I, I find that idea very helpful. Can we... I don't see any questions in the chat. So then the, just reminding you about the other two components of what the signal has to do. This is not part of the clarification, but reminding you because they're important. The signal has to be produced by the machine, right? I said that the event supervisor must see and hear it for themselves. Um, and it, again, it has to be distinct. So we're not going to count ticks. You know, we will just take the first three times. You'll, you'll tell us what the signal is. You'll display it. And then we will just take the first three times it happens, and those will be the times on the time trial. All right, great. Thank you for uh, just laying that all out really clearly. I've seen like an endless stream of students in online forums asking about this. It's like the big question of the season is what's going on with this it's about time signal. And it's just a little bit complicated, but I think it's a really cool concept for something to have to build. Thank you. Uh, okay, so now we've talked about the goals of the device, the parameters of the device, uh, clarifying some of the difficult uh, things to understand about the rules. So now I'm thinking, what do I build? Like what <laughs> sorts of things could work here? Um, yeah, sure. So um, there, there's there's quite a few different possibilities for what you might build. Um, and they're, you know, they're pretty much uh, the same uh, fundamental um, kinds of mechanisms that you might have used last year. Um, water and sand uh, uh, driven um, mechanisms are, are uh, relatively straightforward to build. Um, when when we were originally writing these rules, I actually built a, a, a water uh, mechanism that um, that that did this repeating, resetting itself kind of action um, pretty quickly. So so that that's a fairly straightforward one to do. Um, certainly, uh, uh, escapement clocks uh, can be can be adapted to do this. And, um, and I'm sure the a rolling ball concept is, is possible as well. Um, so, so many, many different possibilities there. But again, the, the central idea is that you wanna try and create a mechanism that resets itself at the end of each interval to make it ready to repeat for the next interval. Glad to hear the event supervisors can make their own device. I'm not asking anybody to do something you haven't done. <laughs> That's important. <laughs> uh, okay, so do you have any 
top line big tips where do people go wrong a common error um, that I think people make is just trying to use last year's device um, this is a very different device and so read 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 the rules don't don't just come in with last year's it won't work it won't do the thing right uh, it's not designed this is this is a very different task and what's the uh, fun in that <laughs> yes that too that too <laughs> Um, so this is, this is an odd one, but last year we kept seeing teams bring in multiple devices. Um, you can't do that. Your, your device has to be, you know, or thinking that they could change out critical features of it, um, or have like, like between, the time trials. between the time trials and no, it has to be one device um that that you utilize right. uh this was this, a, this an example yeah i remember this and i th i think a a common example was a team with like a a sand or a water timer might have more than one where the sand or water dispense that uh varying speeds so they'd use one of them for the really short time interval and one for the uh, really long time interval and that's what you're talking about. Like, really, it's that's more than one device if you're changing what you're using between the different trials. That's right. That that's a good example. Thank you, Kira. Uh, I remember one with um, you know two different escapements on each side of the mm. the, the wood too. Um, accidentally using electronics. So Ian, you know, highlighted about the the um, using electronic scale. You can only use it for preparing. You can't use it as part of the device. But people will unthinkingly use a light as the signal, which it's not detector building. That's <laughs> no, a different and it's event. Not, and that's electronic. I mean, it's it's not it's and it and it's it's disappointing for us because we have to call that. You know, we it's not running your device. It's not electricity running your device. It's an incidental, unthinking mistake, but don't use a light, all right? Um, planning, not planning for this device to fit in the 80 centimeter box. Um, and I would even recommend 79.5 because cubes shift, boxes shift. Um, and it, so plan for that. Um, but also again, don't forget you've got to impound the water and the sand. That's you may not have, you know, we're we're not required to provide you water. Uh you've you've got to bring it. Um and, and some of the of the venues uh were in a room that doesn't have water. Yeah. So um you don't have to impound your, your cleanup stuff, right? Like if you want to bring a bucket to dump your water in at the end, we're not that that's not part of it, but that's like device. a tool. And that's, that's a tool. Separate. That's a tool. And that's a kindness to the event supervisors as well. Um, the signal, the signal, the signal. We've talked about that. Please pay attention. Please be thoughtful thinking about that. The consequences of a construction violation are can be pretty heavy in this event, right? The students will be told that they have a construction violation. And if they can fix it during their competition time, then they will get a score, but their device score will be multiplied by 0.7. You know, that's reducing their score, but they, they still will be able to get a score. But if they have a construction violation that they can't fix, then we can let them compete, assuming it's safe, right? But they will not receive a score for the device. Um, and that's a big hit for, you know, 45% of your score in the event. Now you can still get an exam score. You can still get a score for the log. But especially for something, you know, so pay attention to the signal, pay attention to it fitting in that 80 centimeter box, because that's a terrible, that one frustrates us to have to call uh, as a penalty. Um, be, be thoughtful. We, we hate to impose that on teams. Um, so. Yeah, that's always a heartbreaking situation. But I think when you consider what the construction parameters are in this event, if any of them have been violated, you really just haven't done the task. And so it it makes sense that we can't assign a device like that the score. Yeah, not to trash talk another event, but you know, we're not scrambler where you've got a zillion little measurements on this egg backdrop or something. Right? It's just one big measurement. Don't use electronics, get a signal right. <laughs> yeah. It's yeah. not it's not that many criteria, so you can get them all right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh Ian, do you have anything to add? 
Um, yeah, a few few tips about construction um, and 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 about preparing for the event. You um, you want to build out of stable, solid materials because um, you want your device to behave the same way every time. That, that's really important that it's repeatable. Um, so so you know, use wood, not straws. Um, use put it together with wood glue or epoxy or CA glue, not hot glue um, or tape. Um, well, sometimes tape can be can be appropriate, but oh my goodness, not hot glue. It's great for crafts, but it's terrible for building things. Um, uh, you'll wanna practice setting up your device in the allowed five minutes. And then, and this is even more important, you wanna practice resetting it for the second trial. Um, the the allowed time for resetting your device uh, depends on the tournament. It goes from 90 seconds at regionals down to 60 seconds at nationals. Um, and and we we saw a lot of teams that had never practiced resetting it with a with a stopwatch, and they took a very long time to do it. Um, more generally, you want to practice quite a bit, uh, quite a lot. You you need to calibrate your device and that takes many, many trials. And in the process of doing those trials, you will learn how to troubleshoot your device as well, which is really important for, for competition day. Um, you'll, and to that end, you'll, you'll wanna build your device well ahead of the tournament so that you have time to practice and calibrate. Um, also make sure you practice over the entire range uh, um, the, these devices often don't behave in a linear fashion. So, you know, just because you find the setting that hits a, a 10 second interval doesn't mean that you multiply the amount of sand by two and it will automatically be 20 seconds. Uh, sometimes these, there, there are nonlinear effects in your device actually fairly often. So you'll want to practice um, over the whole range of interval lengths. Those are some great pointers. Uh, yeah, I, I I appreciate that you brought up this idea of practicing, practicing a lot uh, and practicing the way that you're gonna have to do this at a competition. Yeah. Uh, I've, I've judged this with you two a little bit before and this was a, a big deal that, that teams who had not practice the procedure that's laid out in the rules um had a really hard time getting a score not because their device was illegal in any way but because they didn't know how to use it to actually complete the task or set it up hadn't, yeah um and, and for some types of of uh designs that um that resetting time is actually a really limiting factor. Uh, so so much so that it seemed to me that it was almost, it, it seems like one of the things that you need to keep at the top of your mind is your designing. Yes, yeah, it's a key design issue. I would also suggest, you know, you get five minutes the first time to set it up. Uh, and hopefully you're not trying to fix a construction problem in that time that eats up your five minutes. You'll be told the intervals ahead, you know, um, at the start of that five minutes. So you can also hopefully do the calculations or whatever you're going to need for the second one. So you'll be well prepared and that'll cut down your time for the reset as well. Yeah. Doing those calculations in your setup time is a big help. Um, okay. Moving on, can we get more into the details of how we're scoring? Uh, how we're scoring the device, yes. Yeah. Um, so you get up to 15 points for each of the time trials. Uh, so five points for each time the device signals. So let's take one time trial with three signals. Each of the three signals is five points minus how close it is to when it was supposed to signal. And that can never be less than zero. So, um, so don't worry about that. So if a device is supposed to signal at say 10 seconds and it signals at 12 seconds, it's two seconds off. 
So it's five minus two equals three points for that one signal. Um, so you get a score, essentially you get a score for a signal if it's within five seconds of the target signal. And that doesn't change no matter what the target signal is. So you can see then how a device will score up to 15 points then. It would have to be spot on for each of the three signals to do it though in, in the one time trial. Okay. Kira, you That's, look like you might have a question about that. It's just always a little complicated with these events. You know, there's all these formulas and then there's multiple trials. And I just wanted to put a quick plug in that uh, we don't ever score these events by hand. And, you know, on top of all that, then they get like different team scores are scaled against each other. We do these with spreadsheets and those spreadsheets are online. Uh, we don't have our VASO versions up quite yet, but it won't be too much longer before we post them. Uh, you can find the national versions of these spreadsheets um, on their website, uh, which for this event, they'll be uh, extremely similar. So if you're ever trying to figure out like, oh, we've been practicing, what does this actually score? Like you can download those spreadsheets and, uh, and plug your numbers in. Yeah. Yeah, um, but but that's the basic idea. Um, five points for each one of the signalings based on how close you are to it. Uh, are we've there already penalties. Yeah, we've already discussed the construction penalty, right? Um, but if the device has to be touched once, like Ian was talking about, because it jams, um, and remember, you can't touch it to mess with the timing. You can't like see it jam, check your watch. Think of, oh, I got like three more seconds to go. You know, we're wise to the ways of that, right? You just got to stop the jam as soon as you see it. <laughs> um, it, it. You can't play with a jam to, to affect the timing of your device. But if you've, if you've had to touch it just the once to fix the jam, um, the, device store, the device score for that trial is multiplied by 0.5, so it's halved. I think the rules also say that it does recognize that one touch might be a couple of movements. It's not saying I get one finger, I get to go, you know, I might have to jiggle a couple of things to call turn that a touch, or... turn or something like that. So right. the word touch is a little ge more general than specific, you know, that we understand touch in English. It's similar language to how, how touch is interpreted in Mission Possible, if you've ever done that event yeah yeah all right that's good to know oh but if there's i'm sorry if there's any i, I forgot what that said. if there's any other competition rule violation other than that device touch then the device scores for that trial is multiplied by 0.9 and if you want to see a couple of scoring samples you know with numbers laid out there's two in the rules so take a look at those two Great. Make sure we love sure. reminding people to read the rules. <laughs> I feel like we just need a button. <laughs> read the rules. Read the rules, read the rules. <laughs> that should be the backdrop instead of uh, these wonderful yeah. icons. <laughs> okay, so um, what does tournament day look like? Um, sure. So, so this is an impound event, and uh, what that means is that um, er early in the day, you will take your device uh, and uh, other components integral to its operations, such as the sand or water and the design log. And you will, you will take those to a designated location at the tournament and you will turn them in and they will be stored at that location um, throughout the day until you are ready to uh, compete. Um, you do not need to impound your binder or uh, calculators, tools, cleaning supplies. Um, but but just please do remember that you're impounding sand or water if your device uses it and your design log. Um, now, when your actual session comes around, the, your, your competition time, um, at the beginning of that session, the two time intervals will be announced. Um, there will be a five minute setup at the start of the session. And uh, if you have a construction violation, you, you may attempt to fix it at that time. Um, there will be a penalty, but you'll still get a score if you manage to fix it. Um, 
and then uh, and then the the divide the well, if you're at a tournament where the exam and the device testing are running concurrently, the the exam will start at the end of that five minutes, and during the written exam, the device testing teams will come around and test your device, interrupting your written exam. And then as soon as you finish, you go back to finishing your exam. Um, at some uh, tournaments, including VASA regionals, the written exam will actually be held separately. And then uh, you know, you'll know you have your five minutes set up and immediately do your device testing. Um, so some, um, some common problems uh, at, on tournament day that we see. Um, not practicing the resetting of the device for the second trial within the allowed time. We talked about that a little bit earlier. Um, on your exam, the written exam, uh, a common uh, issue we see is ignoring significant figures and units. Numerical answers require units in most cases. Um, and uh, significant figures um, is, is important as well. Um, if if significant figures is a is an unfamiliar uh, concept to you, uh, do spend a little bit of time to look that up and and learn a little bit about it. There is also a an official um, significant figures uh, um, policy on the on the national website that actually goes through the specific way that nationals interpret significant figures. There's a link to that document and the clarification and where you'll find this video on uh, the event page. Uh, Ian, would you share your screen for just a second? We'll show the event page uh, sure. uh, on the uh, VASO event page for It's About Time. So I'm pretty sure the significant figures document is there. And there's a lot of mistakes for that. I can tell you when Ian and I grade, we grade for significant figures. Uh, I will say not everybody does. There's the big clarification that that Karen spoke about earlier about the the one mechanism and the the single signal, and and then there's some resources down here. And there's the significant figures guidelines. Right. Okay. Thanks. So the, yeah. the significant figures document is an is an easy read. So don't be scared. You know, in into that. In watching lots of different events, supervisors work on lots of different tests. I know that everyone will choose to grade wrong significant figures a little bit differently, but it's not uncommon to have a policy of just, I'm going to only give half credit if there's the wrong number of significant figures, and then unwittingly a team loses half their points. Uh, so don't don't take that lightly. That's a big deal. Right. We strive to do just good science here. Um, okay, so another another common problem that we see on on tournament day is people not giving enough attention to their design log and their charts. Um, and and you know, I'll combine this is ten points, which is, um, you know, the smaller part of your score certainly, but it it, it makes a real difference. And we've seen lots of teams that that you know this made the difference between a medal or not a medal so so don't ignore this uh, you need to impound your design log and charts and then it's a good idea to keep a copy for yourself um, because we don't always have an opportunity to return them um, and, and and make them for real don't don't just you know don't just make up stuff on your way to the tournament on the bus or something I, the, these are these are included in the event to help you understand your device and 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 actually improve your device and do better at the event. Um, you, so you don't, when it comes to the graphs, don't forget that we only grade one of the graphs or charts. So so those things in the grading rubric and the rules have to be true on that one graph in order to be true. So or in order to get points. So so like one of those things on the rubric is. Uh, that the entire data range needs to be spanned and it needs to be spanned in one graph, not across all your graphs. Um, and then if you use a digital fabrication technique, that's a fancy word for 3D printing or laser cutting, or there's a few other 
possibilities, but those are the two that we see most often. Um, uh, there are some extra requirements and there are some extra information that you need to include in your design log. Um, and and so so make sure you read that and uh, and include those items. Um, but but I, I will say, don't think that you need to do digital fabrication. Um, it It's a useful tool and lots of teams use it to good effect, but you can absolutely make a winning device without it as well. Um, it's, it's really just a choice. Great, those are some awesome sort of summarizing thoughts. Karen, did you have anything you wanted to add? No, I think uh, I think that that covers it. Great, yeah, we're we're coming to the end of our time, so uh, so I think we can stop there. This has been really awesome. Uh, the two of you have had so many great bits of advice, um, and I I hope that this is really helpful to teams as they uh, as they get working on this. Thank you both. You bet. Thanks.